Horner syndrome results from a disruption of the oculosynthetic pathway. So the sympathetic fibers first start from the hypothalamus and this is where the first order neurons start. So I'm using this as the cell body of the first order neuron in the hypothalamus. It travels down the midbrain through the pons, through the medulla, and then goes all the way to C8, T1, and synapses over there. So this is the first order neuron that starts from the hypothalamus. So this is the hypothalamus and ends up into the spinal center of the spinal cord. The second order neurons start from here. So this has ended over here. The second order neuron, the cell body is over here in the cervicothoracic region, goes out of the spinal cord, travels on top of the apex of the lung, makes a loop around it, and then starts climbing up at the junction of the external carotid artery. This is the external carotid artery and this is the internal carotid artery. There is the superior cervical ganglion and this synapse is over here. So we had the first order neuron, this is the second order neuron, and the third order neuron goes out from here. So some fibers travel over along the external carotid artery and these supply to the sweat glands and other fibers travel along with the internal carotid artery. They form a plexus on the internal carotid artery and these travel along one of the branches of the fifth nerve. In the cavernous sinus, they travel along and go into the eye. These are the fibers that are involved in supplying the smooth muscles of the eyelids and the dilator pupillary muscles. So we have three different neurons that are involved in the synthetic pathway. So let me use a different color here. So this arrow, this is the first order neurons. And first order neuron starts from here and ends here. Then this is the second order neuron, which starts from right here and ends here. And then we have the third order neuron that start here. So this is the third order neuron, starts here and ends in the eye. Horner syndrome consists of three main features. One is ptosis, which is the droopiness of the eyelid. The second is meiosis, which is constriction of the pupil. And the third is anhydrosis, which is lack of sweating. Localization of Horner syndrome is very simple. You have to think about the neighbors of the sympathetic tract in different locations. So the f if there is a first order neuron-ish problems, we call it a central Horner syndrome. If the second order neuron is involved, we call it a preganglionic Horner syndrome. And if the third order neuron is involved, we call it a postganglionic Horner syndrome. Now you can start thinking about the different structures and how to localize those. So I'm going to use a light blue color here. So let me just use light blue color. Any pathology in the midbrain, if, if there is a pathology in the midbrain, you start looking for other signs of midbrain involvement, such as a third nerve palsy, a fourth nerve palsy. If somebody has a sixth nerve palsy and a Horner syndrome, you start thinking of the quarantine involved. If the, if the synthetic fiber is involved in the medulla, this very often leads to a full lateral medullary syndrome, which is also called Wallenberg syndrome. And you can look up the Wallenberg syndrome in one of my previous videos. If a person has a spinal cord syndrome with Horner syndrome, that basically is revealing in itself. 
if there are no features of brainstem deficits and if there is no sign to suggest a spinal cord involvement, you should consider the possibility that this could be a tumor coming out of the lungs. So let me just show you here if the apex of the lung is involved and if you have a tumor that is right there that will that can cause in, uh, that can involve the sympathetic tract and it will cause a preganglionic Horner syndrome. So if you have a preganglionic Horner syndrome, you should always consider a lung tumor, what is called a pancos tumor. Now a few things to keep in mind. If the lesion is before the superior cervical ganglion, so this is the superior cervical ganglion right here. So if the lesion is before the superior cervical ganglion, you get a Horner syndrome with anhydrosis, with lack of sweating on the side of the face, the same side of the face. If it is post ganglion, if the lesion is somewhere over here, it tends to spare the sweat glands. You do have some deficits of sweating on the lateral side of the nose and on the forehead, but it's not as vast as if it, it would have been if it was a pre-ganglionic lesion. If somebody presents with a severe neck pain in Horner syndrome, you should consider the possibility that there could be a carotid dissection and the lesion would be somewhere around this area. So that is how easy it is to localize Horner syndrome. The further diagnosis of Horner syndrome can be done by using different chemical agents. I'm not going to go into details about the use of cocaine drops, apraclonidine, and phenylephrine. You can basically read about those or look up other videos which discuss that in more detail.